Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tom Schmelk, and I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service. Thank you for attending this uh, presentation on brown tail moth during Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month in February. The state of Maine is home to more than 20,000 species of insects, um, and many of them are very diverse, as you can see from these photos. Most of these 20,000 species of insects are beneficial to both us and the environment. Many of them provide uh, ecological services um, to the environment, which in turn benefits us. Um, this should always be top of mind when you are considering uh, management for brown tail moth or other pests such as ticks or mosquitoes. Uh, like the Board of Pesticide Control's motto is, think first, spray last. So brown tail moth is originally native to Europe and it was introduced accidentally into Somerville, Massachusetts around 1897 and it sort of spread from there uh, to other parts of New England and it's been established in Maine since 1904. So within 17 years of its initial introduction, it spread to encompass almost all of New England and then also parts of Southern Canada. Starting in the Late 19 teens, uh, the population began to uh, sort of decrease and, and drop off. And this was due to wet weather, as well as a combination of a fungus and a virus that attacks brown tail moth. Um, so the population kept reducing in size until about the 1970s. It was pretty much just found off the coast of Maine in high numbers, um, as well as Cape Cod. So starting in the 1980s, we began to see mainland populations cropping up. And then by 1994, we were seeing uh, defoliation that we were able to pick up from the air. And pretty much since 1994 until present day, we have not mapped under 400 acres of defoliation from this pest. The last major outbreak before this current one that we are in, uh, we experienced in the early 2000s. And the peak of that outbreak was in 2003, where we had a peak of about 11,000 acres that we detected from our aerial surveys. Starting in 2010, we saw a buildup of the population. However, uh, wet weather and the fungus and the virus helped suppress the population. But beginning in 2015, the population started escaping those natural controls uh, and began increasing, which is the start of this current outbreak that we are in. In 2019, there was a drop in the population due to high disease, but we also had a limited ability to survey from the air that year. In 2021, we mapped uh, just about 200,000 acres of defoliation, uh, which is very alarming if you look at the peak of the outbreak in 2003. In 2022, we did map about 50,000 acres less defoliation than we did in 2021, and this was partially due to uh, the fungus and the virus. So we chose to have a brown tail moth awareness month in February, um, just to sort of increase awareness, uh, even though we do many press releases and TV and paper and radio interviews, it doesn't necessarily reach everyone. So this is another, uh, effort to get awareness about brown tail moth in these communities that are really affected. So the whole point of raising awareness is to basically spread the word and help your neighbors out if they have a crab apple tree in their front yard that has a ton of winter webs, but they're just not aware of it, you know, knocking on that door uh, will help the community um, and encourage community action. February is also a good time to plan ahead for adverse brown tail moth conditions. If you are living in one of those heavily infested areas, now is the time to sort of come up with a game plan and um, figure out how you're gonna manage if you are gonna manage brown tail in your own dooryard. So the main reason why we're talking about brown tail moth is that the caterpillars are covered in these irritating hairs. And these hairs are both barbed and hollow and filled with a toxin. So not only are you getting a mechanical irritation from the barbs, but you're also getting a chemical irritation from the toxin within each hair. These hairs can cause a poison ivy-like rash in most people and sort of just like poison ivy, some people don't react at all. Some pe people react very severely, but 
but most people are sort of in the middle and have that uh, mildly irritating rash. So the theme of Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month are the four R's, and those four R's are recognize, remove, recruit, and reach out. So we'll start off with the first R, which is recognize, and basically we're going to be recognizing where brown tail moth is at any given point during the year in its life cycle. So we'll start off with the life stage that they are in now, which is um, they are hibernating in these palm-sized winter webs, the very tips of the branches. So inside each one of those palm-sized webs is between 25 and 400 caterpillars. And they will stay in that web until mid-April when it becomes pretty warm out and the caterpillars will re-emerge and sort of bask on the outside of that palm-sized winter web. From there, they will uh, start feeding on bursting buds and newly emerged leaves, and they will feed basically from mid-April until the end of June. During this time period, the caterpillars are going to be eating and growing and shedding their skin. And not only do the caterpillars have those toxic hairs that I mentioned, but also their shed skins uh, also contain those toxic hairs. So as the caterpillars grow and get larger, they will have more of those toxic hairs, and they will also become less gregarious and start to wander away uh, from their food source. Um, you may encounter them on the side of your house or um, crawling across your driveway. Beginning in late June, they're going to start wandering and, and looking for a nice uh, sheltered place to pupate and spin that cocoon to go into the next stage of their life. And that cocoon that they spin also has those toxic hairs impregnated in it. So it's a very dangerous, another very dangerous part of the life cycle. So in that late June, early July time frame, they're going to spend a, about a couple of weeks in that uh, pupil stage. And then the adult moths are going to begin emerging in early uh, to mid-July. And those moths are going to be... Um, they're going to be attracted to their mates, and then the females, once they've mated, will lay eggs right on the host foliage. As she's laying those eggs, the female moth will cover that egg mass with hairs from her abdomen. Um, those are not the toxic hairs you have to worry about. They're just uh, regular hairs. They're not the barbed toxic hairs that are on the caterpillars. So after um, a few weeks, those eggs are going to hatch. Uh, they're, they'll be hatching out in August. And what those caterpillars will do once they have uh, emerged from that egg mass is that they'll start feeding gregariously. And during that whole time period, they are not only feeding together, but they're also building that winter web that they will spend all winter in. During this time, those very tiny caterpillars, they're not going to be uh, defoliating the whole leaf. They're not going to be consuming the whole entire leaf. They're going to be uh, sort of grazing on the outer layer of the leaf, which causes it to die and turns a sort of a bronzy, copperish color. Um, this type of damage is called skeletonization. Typically, sometime in late September, the web is uh, pretty complete, and these caterpillars will then all crawl inside and uh, overwinter in that, that palm-sized winter web. Um, and then again, emerge in mid-April, sort of completing the cycle. So recognizing where to find the winter webs, um, brown tail moth caterpillars are not very picky eaters, um, but they do have certain uh, host preferences within Maine. So many of those host preferences are going to include stuff like fruit trees, and that includes apples, cherries, service berry, hawthorn, roses, etc. Um, and don't forget your ornamental crab apples and your ornamental cherries. Uh, you can also find them pretty prevalently in oaks, elms, birches, poplar, um, as well as our native black cherry. When you're looking to spot these webs, you're also going to want to make sure that you're looking in the outer and upper parts of the crown at the very tips of the branches. Um, and if you are out in your yard surveying, you're going to want to pick a nice sunny day and stand with the sun to your back and look up at the tops of the trees and the bright white silk that composes these winter webs will shine very brightly in the sunlight. So recognizing what the brown tail moth winter webs look like um, is very crucial in order to help manage them or inform your management decisions. So typically it is composed of a few leaves that are sort of silked together and silk 
to the uh, actual branch tip of the tree. Um, and that's where you can, you'll be able to see that sunlight sort of shining off. And even though brown toe moth winter webs are sort of variable, they can be something as simple as a single leaf that's sort of folded over and soaked on the inside, um, or whether they're more typical and have multiple leaves attached to them. Uh, they're always going to have this nice bright white silk where the petiole of the leaf uh, attaches to the branch. Uh, so there are a couple of lookalikes um, that can be confused for brown tail moth winter webs. Um, and two of them are Cecropia and Promethea moths. Those are our native silk moths. And they are found on some of the same hosts that brown tail moth are, as well as they are a similar size. So one way to differentiate these two species is, again, by looking for that nice, fresh, bright white silk that only brown tail moth webs uh, contain. Um, and it's pretty much heavily silked where that petiole meets the, the twig. Um, for these two species of silk moths that can be confused for them, uh, one of the things to look for is the silk will be a little more brown, a little bit more dull. And then also think uh, these are two of our biggest moth species that we have here in the Northeast. And it's a single individual that's inside each one of these um, silk moth cocoons. So it'll sort of look a little bit more like a coin purse or a satchel um, rather than the comparatively messy winter webs of brown tail, which are comprised of leaves and silk sort of intertwined. Um, and also think that that's a communal effort between many, many different caterpillars, not just one individual that is forming a pupa. So also recognizing that it's brown tail moth awareness month um, is very important and organizing a winter web survey in your community, um, school, uh, right in here in your own yard is very important for uh, the management or informing management decisions around brown tail. So the second R is remove. And whenever you're removing uh, brown tail moth winter webs, um, if it's not on a property that you own, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you get permission from that landowner. Um, almost all the time, they will grant you permission to remove those webs. Um, you're also gonna to wanna to be thinking of safety, uh, having a, a ladder. If you have a ladder out there, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're having somebody foot that ladder um, and not trimming near power lines and other unsafe activities like that. So as you clip out these uh, palm-sized winter webs, you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, you destroy them and you can destroy them in one of either two methods. Uh, you can either burn them if you have a wood stove or if you have a permit for a burn barrel, or you can uh, clip the webs and put them in a bucket of soapy water and soak them for a few days and that will kill uh, all of the, the caterpillars inside. And you're going to want to make sure that you destroy these webs um, or clip them before mid-April. Again, mid-April is when the caterpillars start emerging and the risk for hair activity is increased, um, as well as uh, the caterpillars sort of start wandering and, and eating. So in order to clip these winter webs, you're going to want to make sure that you put a kit together. And that kit should include safety gear, such as gloves. Um, or duct tape if you do run into any of the hairs, and a partner. Um, also, some of the hardware that you'll need is a large bucket with or without soapy water, uh, hand snips, loppers, an extendable pro pull pruner, a long-handled hook to pull down branches so that they're within reach of clipping, um, and then lawn and leaf bags uh, to store the webs for uh, burning or for later disposal in a bucket. So one of the things that you can do and we encourage you to do is to organize a winter web removal um, community event in your at your school um, at, and just within your community or your neighborhood in general. Um, we suggest to make it fun by challenging a, a rival school or a rival town to see how many uh, webs you can clip out, um, warming fire to burn those webs, and uh, other activities in association with one of these clipping events. So recruit is another one of the four R's. And uh, basically we ask that you, you know, sort of look at your scenario and 
uh, if the webs are too high to clip out um, to actually reach out and recruit um, some professional tree care professionals um, in order to help either clip those webs out um, or plan for chemical treatment. So we do have a list of licensed arborists and licensed pesticide applicators that are willing to, to do brown tail moth work. And those lists can be found on our brown tail moth uh, website on the main forest service page. So reaching out is the fourth R and we always encourage um, people to work together uh, to respond to this problem. Uh, the more widespread the effort, the better the results will be. Um, and if you do have any ideas, you can reach out to us at foresthealth at maine.gov. So some other helpful hints, if you are living in an infested area, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you try to avoid those areas uh, as much as you can, especially in dry and windy conditions. Those are prime conditions for the hairs to become airborne again and cause issues. Um, some other things are reducing the mowing schedule. Mowing will, especially if it's hot and dry, will again make those uh, hairs airborne and, and cause issues for you. If you do have to be out in the yard uh, doing yard work, um, one of the things you can also do is either work on days that uh, just after it's rained or use a garden hose to wet down the area uh, before you rake up those leaves or before you um, cut that grass. One of the things that our crews have found is that uh, pre-contact poison ivy wipes um, help to close your pores. And for poison ivy, it prevents the oil from getting in there, but it also is helpful uh, to close your pores so that the brown tail moth hairs do not uh, stick in. So another uh, course of action for brown tail moth is to do a landscape wide mitigation. So we typically recommend that people keep their lights off in July and the first part of August in order to prevent uh, attracting more brown tail moth into your yard. Every year on social media, I see people uh, running light traps with buckets full of moths um, and saying that it, it really solved their problem. Look how many moths that they are killing. Um, and unfortunately, it's only the males that are attracted directly to the light. Um, the females are attracted to the light too. However, they uh, sort of land outside of the reach of the light on the host foliage. Um, and unfortunately, it is not the males that really drive the population. It's those females that are not coming directly to light and sort of hanging out outside of the reach of that light. A lot of these people running these light traps um, have sent me photos in November, December, once the leaves are off the trees of the area surrounding their light trap, and they are more heavily impacted uh, by those winter webs than in the, the surrounding area, unfortunately. Uh, another course of action is tree removal. And typically, we do not recommend tree removal just for brown tail moth. Um, I always say that it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. But just having um, having a tree there, if you decide that you don't like the tree or if it's unhealthy, uh, but it is also a brown tail moth host, you can remove it and that will sort of alleviate some of the problems. Uh, if you do decide that you are going to plant trees or if you're uh, sort of replacing trees that have been taken down, we sort of just ask you to look at the species composition and stay away from uh, preferred hosts for brown tail, which include oak, elm, at, uh, poplar, and any fruit trees, which include those ornamental crab apples and um, ornamental cherry trees. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us at foresthealth at maine.gov um, or also check out our brown tail moth page on the Maine Forest Service website. Uh, included is a list of free, frequently asked questions um, that is very helpful and sort of covers more of these topics in detail.